How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my first video on the channel, and as well as talking about the first section of Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics, introduction, I hope that this will serve to introduce what exactly this channel is all about. Though, if you're not interested, you can always skip to the next timestamp down on the progress bar below. Essentially, I hope that these videos will act as a more clear and, in a way, friendly introduction to texts concerning semiology or semiotics, psychoanalysis, philosophy, and sociology, particularly those dealing with post-structuralism and critical theory more generally, going chapter by chapter and part by part. I hope that the connection to Stardew Valley and other games will make it a bit more interesting than just listening to me talking to the void for 20 or so minutes. Although this channel is mainly going to be focused on works of Philly Squattery, as you all might have been able to tell from the name and the channel icon, the first few series of episodes I make are going to be introducing the ideas of Ferdinand de Saussure through course general linguistics and Jacques Lacan through Bruce Fink's book The Lacanian Subject. The reason for this first focus is to essentially set the groundwork for looking at Guattari's own writings. Now, with that out of the way, what is this first series going to be about? Well, these first 10 videos will be on the lectures of the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, my character is currently set as. These lectures were collected after his death as a course in general linguistics and served as the backbone for structuralism and later post-structuralism. The ideas posited in the course were influential not only in linguistics, but also in philosophy, psychoanalysis, psychology, sociology, and even anthropology. Saussure's own interest lay primarily in historical linguistics, how languages change over time. But, through the course of his lectures, he developed an idea of a sign as a linguistic unit. It's this idea of signs that we will be focusing on during these videos, and that I hope will be helpful in clarifying later thinkers like Lacan later on. First of all, who was Ferdinand de Saussure? To give a little background, Saussure, now known as the father of one linguistics, was born in Geneva, Switzerland on the 26th of November 1857. An accomplished student, he spent a year studying Latin, ancient Greek, and Sanskrit at the University of Geneva before moving to Germany to continue his studies at the University of Leipzig. There, he would write a paper that massively reimagined the vowel system of Proto-Indo-European would have worked. Soon after, he would leave Leipzig for the University of Berlin, where he continued his study of Sanskrit, along with the Celtic languages. He would return to Leipzig to defend his and earn his doctorate in 1880. For the next couple of decades, he would lecture on Gothic and Old High German at the University of Paris, the École Pratique des Hautes Études, also in Paris. Whilst at the latter, he would be named a Knight of Legion of Honour, the highest order of merit bestowed by France. He would spend the rest of his life as a lecturer at the University of Geneva on Sanskrit and Proto-Indo-European. It was here, in the early years of the 20th century, that he was put in charge of a course on general linguistics, which brings us to the topic of this video. In course on general linguistics, composed of lecture notes written between the years of 1906 and 1916, Saussure looked at the relationship between speech and language evolution, investigating how language acts as a structured system of signs. It includes an introduction, what we'll be looking at here, an appendix, which we will ignore, and five main sections. For this first part of the introduction to the course, we will be looking at the first few chapters. Firstly, a glance at the history of linguistics, then subject matter and scope of linguistics, its relation to other sciences, and finally, but not at all leastly, the object of linguistics. To begin with, what Saussure does in a glance at the history of linguistics is pinpoint the three stages he felt the facts of language went through to get to what he calls its true and unique object. In other words, the three stages that preceded what became linguistics proper. The first stage was when the object of study was grammar. This stage originated with the ancient Greeks and was continued particularly by the French. It wasn't a science per se, it wasn't based on observation. Instead, its main concern was with producing normative rules. Essentially, it was concerned with setting down rules based on what it deemed correct and what was deemed incorrect. Today, you can see its remnants in organizations like the Académie Française, the French regulatory body of language. To give an example from the game, the study of grammar would only be concerned with stating that the, the hat mouse speaks wrong somehow instead of being interested in the mechanisms and reasons behind why it would do so in the first place. The second stage is philology. 
This movement was started in 1777 by, forgive my pronunciation, Friedrich August Wolf. Whilst in the first stage, language wasn't, at the end of the day, truly the object of study, it is here in the second stage that it becomes just that, or starts to shift just that, rather. Philology, according to Saussure, had an important role. Its focus was on investigating, interpreting, and commenting on written works, particularly those in ancient Greek and Latin setting the groundwork for historical linguistics later on. However, Saussure states that it had a major issue that separated it from linguistics proper, more than just its focus on only Latin and Greek antiquity. Philological criticism is still too deficient on one point. It follows the written language too slavishly and neglects the living language. This takes us to the third stage, comparative philology. This stage is in some ways similar to the second. It's still philology. But rather than simple idle commenting on writing that's found in standard philology, comparative philology occurred when philologists discovered they could compare languages. Although there are some traces of it earlier, the stage really came into its own with the work of Franz Bopp, particularly his book on the conjugation system of Sanskrit, which compared Sanskrit with German, Greek, Latin, and Farsi. Bopp realized that the comparison of different languages could become a science in its own right, Adding on to him were scholars like Max Müller, who popularized the school, G. Curtius, who reconciled classic philology with this new philology, and August Schleiler, who systematized the science founded by Bopp. However, this comparative school still had some major problems. First, and most importantly, there was the problem of a lack of historicism. Whilst they did compare different languages, that's true, the only thing they cared about was finding equivalence. That Latin word lines up with this Greek word, this Greek word lines up with that Sanskrit word, etc. They didn't really appreciate the historical aspect of their discoveries, only the comparisons themselves. What this meant was that they looked at language in the same way that naturalists might look at a plant, as Saussure says. He also the example of the aforementioned Schleiler and some of the steps he made. Schleiler, Saussure says, seems to be a confirmed historian based on a starting point which he always looked to be in Proto-Indo-European. However, he had a tendency to generalize, to view things necessarily through the lens of equivalence. He speaks of Greeks E and O in terms of grades on a vowel system, because Sanskrit has a vowel system which can be described as having grades. In a word, he believes that each language goes through the exact same processes, just in slightly different ways, ignoring the very disjointed and heterogeneous nature of language's evolution throughout time. Moving on, Saussure credits both Roman studies and Germanic studies for improving upon the basis set by comparative philology. Roman studies begun by, and again, please forgive my pronunciation, Friedrich Christen Dates, had a privileged position in that it already had its prototype to be examined, Latin. Additionally, the plethora of resources containing Romance languages and dialects allowed researchers to be able to see how language changed throughout time something a bit more difficult to philologists who focused largely on the classic languages and thus whose prototype was the unattested Proto-Indo-European. This allows those studying the Romance languages to include history in their work. Germanic studies went much the same, although without the privilege of having the solid background afforded by Latin as a prototype. Germanic studies had at its disposal massive amounts of records, charting the Germanic languages as they evolved over time, allowing them to get closer than those who had looked purely at comparison. Going onwards, Saussure credits the American linguist William Dwight Whitney with supplying the driving force between the development of linguistics and the neo-grammarian school for linking the results of comparative study to history, for shifting away from the view of language as an organism to the idea that language was a product of a collective mind of linguistic groups. This latter idea is one of his main gripes with comparative philology, which he says acts as if language forms the fourth kingdom of life. I feel like this idea is basically most clearly summed up in the footnote he provides was talking about the neo-grammarians. The new school, using a more realistic approach than had its predecessor, fought the terminology of the comparative school and especially the illogical metaphors that it used. One no longer dared to say, language does this or that, or life of language, etc., since language is not an entity and exists only within speakers. This quote clearly shows how Saussure views language. 
Language for Sassur isn't a living, breathing thing, to engage in some of the same metaphors the new grammarians attacked. It exists only through its speakers. Now, although the new grammarians were leagues better than the original for philologists, Sassur still felt that they didn't go far enough. He felt that the whole question and fundamental problems of language still remain unanswered, something he sought to rectify with these lectures. This segues us into chapter 2 of the introduction, Subject Matter and Scope of Linguistics, its relation with other sciences. As you can probably tell from the title, this chapter deals with what place linguistics has in the sciences and what linguistics concerns. He begins the chapter by listing three things that define what the scope of linguistics should be. A. To describe and trace the history of all observable languages, which amounts to tracing the history of families of languages and reconstructing as far as possible the mother language of each family. B. To determine the forces that are permanently and universally at work in all languages and to deduce the general law to which all specific historical phenomena can be reduced. C. To delimit and define itself. This first thing is what Saussure was most concerned with. If you remember from earlier on in the introduction to the work, his main focus was on historical linguistics. The paper he wrote at the University of Leipzig was concerned with how the Proto-Indo-European vowel system worked. His attacks on comparative philology also come to mind, as many of them rest on the idea that philology ignored the importance of history as it relates to language. The second thing is a bit more interesting to us, or at least to how the course is going to be used by this channel. He is essentially describing structuralism, the forces he talks about are the underlying structures that guide language. Lastly, the third is what he concerns himself with for the rest of the chapter. Where is the line between linguistics and other sciences, particularly those that share data like sociology and anthropology? This is the question Saussure seeks to answer here. It's clear that linguistics is separate from ethnology, a field focusing on different peoples, since languages are only of interest insofar as it is used to document. Anthropology is a bit blurrier, but at the end of the day, Sassur says, it examines humans only in terms of their species, language ignored mostly as a purely social fact. The distinction between the physiology of sounds is similarly a little bit blurry, but fundamentally is quite clear. The physiology of sounds refers to the branch of biology that studies the production and hearing of sound. Although quite important to linguistics, as most languages exist primarily through that exchange of sounds, Saussure says that there will be more to language, something unrelated to phonology, that of a sign, again something we'll touch on later. The question he raises, but doesn't answer here, is where linguistics stops and sociology and social psychology begin. Since a language is a social fact, as seen in its separation from anthropology, it shouldn't fall under the umbrella of sociology, a discipline that exists particularly to analyse such social facts, he asks. He goes on to question that since everything in language is, in a way, psychological, shouldn't it be part and parcel with social psychology? Although neither of these are properly addressed by Celsius from this chapter, he promises to look at them in more detail later on. This latter question, connecting language to psychology, is one that, as we will see, has some major implications for Lacan and psychoanalysis that relies on Celsius's idea of structuralism. Now. Here is where we get a taste for what's to come in the proper lectures of the course. Chapter 3, The Object of Linguistics, deals with what exactly Saussure meant when he first talked about linguistics' true and unique object. Part 1 of the chapter focuses on defining language itself. Setting the stage, he asks, What is both the integral and concrete object of linguistics? The question is especially difficult. Later we shall see why. Here I wish merely to point out the difficulty. Despite his claim that he won't talk about exactly why this question is so complicated to answer, he does in fact discuss it a little bit. The reason why linguistics is so difficult is that, unlike other sciences where objects are given in advance to be studied, like a physicist and atoms, deciding what the object is is a mission in its own right in linguistics. Saussure gives the example of a French word nous, meaning bear or nude. At a glance, it may seem obvious that this is a concrete linguistic object, as a word. However, if you think about it a little deeper, that becomes a bit less clear-cut. Is it an object insofar as it is a word? Or as an expression of an idea, 
or as just a sound, or as the equivalent of the Latin word nudum. A lovely way Saussure sums up this problem is by saying that, essentially, instead of the object preceding the viewpoint, like for example in quantum mechanics, where it isn't atoms or some atomic particles that are in question, but how they function, in linguistics it is rather the viewpoint, is a word, a sound, an idea, an equivalent, etc., that creates its object. What we can see, however, is that regardless of whatever viewpoint we pick up, there are two interrelated sides to language. There's firstly the side of articulated syllables, sounds produced by vocal organs or heard by ear, or as he does mention it, signs produced by the hands and viewed by the eyes in the case of sign languages, and secondly the thought behind the sound. But suppose that sound was a simple thing. Would it constitute speech? No, it's only the instrument of thought. By itself, it has no existence. However, not even with this in mind is the picture complete. Speech always has a history and a future. It is always shifting and changing unpredictably. It is true that speech itself can't really be the integral object of linguistics, what makes linguistics special, I suppose. If you focus your attention on the one side, for example, the side of sound, you fail to understand the complexity of language and fall into another science like the physiology of sound. And if you look on just the mind aspect, you fall into the jaws of social psychology. Looking at it all together, you get a disjointed, constantly changing mess of different elements that lead to just as much a focus on linguistics as on anthropology, philology, and normative grammar. However, Saussure has a solution to this dilemma. As I see it, there is only one solution to all of the foregoing difficulties. From the very outset, we must put both feet on the ground of language and use it as the norm of all other manifestations of speech. He thus offers a distinction between lang, language, and langage, speech. Speech, as we have already discovered, is something of a chaotic mess that connects to many, many different things. Language includes speech, yes, but instead of acting chaotically, acts rather as a self-contained whole, something that lends itself to classification. In addition to speech, language contains all the social conventions that reign in the prior, allowing it to be used for communication between different people. After making this distinction, Saussure goes on to attack the notion that speech should be at the forefront, since it stems from a natural faculty, and that language should be deemed inferior to it due to its status as being learnt. His first point rests on the fact that the very idea of speech being innate is controversial. To, for this, he points tentatively to William Whitney, who he talked about before, and who was believed language to be nothing more than just another social institution. Whitney's thesis was that it was just dumb luck that caused people to use their mouths and communicate instead of something else, like gesture. And indeed, it's true that many deaf and hard of hearing babies don't babble as much. So Sula isn't too big into the idea of it being only luck mind, and states that nature had a bigger role, but he does agree that language is a convention and how it is communicated matters little in the grand scheme of things. The next section is where it really gets interesting. For place of language in the facts of speech, it offers the first look into the distinction between signify and signified, the part of the puzzle that is oh so important to essentially everything else this channel will cover. His first order of business is to reconstruct what he calls the speaking circuit, to isolate the part of speech that is involved in language from speech as a whole. He gives this diagram of two people conversing, A and B. The circuit starts in A's brain, where concepts like the idea of his pomegranate associated with linguistic representations, or sounds, the word, spoken, Saussure calls this the sound image. The circuit starts out as psychological, this association of concept and sound image. It continues physiologically through A speaking. Next, in a purely physical process, the sound waves from A are transmitted to B from the prior's mouth to the latter's ears. The first psychological process then occurs again, just in reverse. He associates the sound image released with the A with a concept, a pomegranate in this context. Here is a diagram of the process laid out properly as a circuit. These ideas are what make up the heart of signifiers and signified. Sound images are what Saussure will come to call signifiers, and concepts are signifieds. It's simple as. Looking more broadly, Saussure now states to look away from the individual act of speaking and to look at the social fact instead the prior only being what he calls the embryo of language. His new order of business is finding out how language crystallizes into such a form that allows for vast groups of people to produce roughly the same signs, units composed of signifiers and signifiers, or rather, concepts and sound images. The answer obviously doesn't align with physiological, even if you can't understand it, 
one can still hear other languages. The sound images are perceived, even if not the content. Although the components of sound image and content are psychological, neither is that side completely responsible. The executive side is missing, for execution is never carried out by the collectivity. Execution is always individual, and the individual is always its master. I shall call the executive side parole. What he means by this is that part of the psychological aspect of speech is necessarily confined to individuals, not to groups of people. Bechol, often translated to speaking, refers to the concrete use of speech, to the everyday use of language in specific instances. So, where could language itself be? Language for Saussure isn't something individual. It's the collective structure of word images, or signs, filled up by members of a given community. Take the Junimos, for example. They may engage in moments of Bechol, of speech, where they form speaking circuits. These circuits undoubtedly are full of different idiosyncrasies, like slang and dialectical differences. Just look at me, saying you all and how's it. But at the end of the day, they're all going off the same structure, the Junimo language. This includes all those different idiosyncrasies of everyday instances of speech and then some. In the same way that English includes y'all and how's it, but also yin's, thou and howdy. Language doesn't just exist entirely in one person. That would be impossible due to how massively vast it is. No, rather it exists in the collectivity of different people. Saussure's goal in making clear the distinction between speaking and language is to essentially draw a line between what is social, language, and what is individual, speech, with the end result being making it clear what is essential and what is only accessory, again, language and speech in that order. Ending the section, he lists what he sees as the four fundamental characteristics of language. Firstly, we have the fact that language is the social side of speech, something that an individual can never individually modify or create, something that exists only through what Saussure describes as a sort of social construct between all the members of a community. It's a well-defined object, although made up of heterogeneous speech. Secondly, Language, unlike speaking alone, is something that lends itself to being studied. In fact, Saussure says that it's necessary for study to ignore the other parts of speech that don't make up language. Thirdly, language is homogenous, the only essential thing being the union of signifiers and signifieds, or speech images and concepts, both elements being psychological in nature. Lastly, no less than speech, language is something concrete. The signs that make it up, although they are psychological, aren't abstractions in any way, they're simply associations that bear the stamp of collective approval, as he states. They're tangible, in as far as they can be written down. This concludes the place of language in the facts of speech, begins the third and last section of a chapter, the place of language in human facts, semiology. As the name suggests, this deals with language as a human behaviour and with what he terms semiology. Essentially, the signs of a life of science in society. The, the word semiology, sorry, comes from the Greek word semion, meaning sign, and the suffix ology, study of. Semiology would, according to Saussure, fall under social psychology, concerning itself with what constitutes signs and what laws and structures govern them. Linguistics would be a subsect of the science, and semiologic nature is why Saussure believes language is special relation to other human institutions like politics and the legal system. His proposal is that language should be examined primarily through the lens of semiology and science, that everything else is secondary. In his eyes, the only way to discover the true nature of language is to learn more about signs, wherever they exist, be that in language itself or in other semiological systems like rights and customs. Now, this concludes the first three chapters of a course in general linguistics by Ferdinand de Saussure. I truly hope you enjoyed or at least learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, please do let me know in the comments so I can do better next time. For the next episode, I'll address the remainder of the book's introduction, looking at the linguistics of speaking and language, the latter's internal and external elements, transcription, and phonology. Until next time, bye!